that people have patchy understanding of data on the web. It's such an enormously complex subject. You know, retailers might use data in a completely different way to search engines. You know, I don't think anybody has ever had access to Google search algorithms and what that means if you are suddenly at the top of the search when you look for something or if you suddenly fall to the bottom. You know, that's something that's very murky and behind the scenes. But similarly, I think that retailers, by and large, have a pretty good open transparent policies they tell you what they're doing with your data you read terms and conditions you know we were always tried to be very transparent with our own business last minute.com like every you know proper retailer now so i think it's enormous varying degrees i think the the big piece that's obviously come from nowhere in the last few years the, the hot topic of social media i think that people are only beginning to understand what it might mean to post things about yourself in a public forum that then might be looked at by people that you work with or might be looked at by people that might employ you in the future or, you know that whole area i think is where people are now only beginning to have a have a think about what that might mean for them the World Wide Web, where you're likely watching this video, is used by millions of people every day for everything from checking the weather, ordering food, and chatting with friends, to raising funds, sharing news, or starting revolutions. We use it from our computers, our phones, even our cars. It's just there, all around us, all the time. But what is it exactly? Think of the web as a bunch of skyscrapers, each representing a web server, a computer always connected to the internet, specifically designed to store information and share it. When someone starts a website, they are renting a room in this skyscraper, filling it with information and linking that information together in an organized way for others to access. Tim Berners-Lee, the father of the World Wide Web, understood that we needed a way to organize information that mirrored this natural arrangement. And the web accomplishes this through hyperlinks. By linking several pages within a website or even redirecting you to other websites to expand on information or ideas immediately as you encounter them, hyperlinks allow the web to operate along the same lines as our thought patterns. The web is so much a part of our lives because in content and structure, it reflects both the wider society and our individual minds. And it connects those minds across all boundaries, not only ethnicity, gender, and age, but even time and space. Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. Most people are unaware of how exposed they've made themselves. Um, I mean, you talk to young people, for example, who've got their own personal blog sites or their presence on YouTube or Facebook, uh, and um, that they may come to regret doing some of the things they did uh, on video, on the internet, or saying the things that they did, uh, especially when they start applying for jobs and um, employers begin to look back through the, the digital record of, of these people, the trace that they've left in the public domain. But um, quite unaware, Every single day that we do something digital, we are potentially leaving a trace out there and that if somebody wanted to find out where we were shopping, what we were doing, who we were communicating with, uh, why we were doing it, what websites we uh, were logging on to, they could do it. Uh, it's, it's a very, very exposed set of media, these uh, uh, electronic communication devices that we now use. And uh, the point is that they're fantastically convenient. None of us would be would willingly give them up, but what we would want, if we really thought carefully about what it meant whenever we use these devices, we would want a much, much greater individual security for our communications. Protest is one of the most democratic things you can do. The government is supposed to be of the people, but because of technology, there's a higher cost to protesting than there ever was. Your phone is constantly leaking lots of information. You could know that I was at the protest. You could know everyone I text messaged at the protest. Every number that I called at that protest. You could know things about my walk, facial recognition, potentially your political views, your motivations, all of these things in seconds. 
We should be very worried, I think, about the amount of data concerning ourselves, including very personal, private, intimate data about ourselves, which is now out there in the public domain, both in private and in public hands. We should be worried about it for a large number of reasons, but one central reason is that this information is stored digitally in one or another location out there in a way that we may not have access to ourselves. And it's very, very easily manipulated. It's very easily changed by somebody who uh, is either uh, lazy, incompetent, or malevolent in some way. It's very easy for that information to be shared and for patterns of information to uh, seem to appear to certain agencies that could put one under suspicion, even if one weren't uh, a suspicious individual. In the last decade, it's become increasingly normal for civil liberties to be eroded and for government agencies to spy on citizens to collect and store their personal information. Regardless of whether you're a fan of right or left-wing policies, this affects every one of us. So we have to take a look at the data and ask ourselves honestly, has all of this actually made us safer? So we're here in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, in a market downtown. The security here is incredibly tight. There are armored cars on the street, police stations on every corner, and tons of surveillance cameras. In the past year, police have stepped up security. The region is now under what's probably the most intense government surveillance in the world. Here, China is experimenting with futuristic spying technologies. In Xinjiang, Chen has taken his methods of mass control to a new level, turning the region into a laboratory for new surveillance technology. ID cards loaded with personal details are used to track people's movements. Residents have different levels of freedom based on factors like ethnicity and religious practices. The system also tracks faces. An immense network of security cameras, some equipped with facial recognition, is constantly monitoring the streets. Facial recognition systems are also used to match people with their ID cards, everywhere from shopping malls to gas stations. Authorities use artificial intelligence that can alert them if someone in a video is walking too fast or parked in the wrong spot. The government has also massively increased human surveillance. It has recruited six times more policemen this year than it did in 2015. Cities are now dotted with brand new police booths, one every couple hundred yards in some Uyghur neighborhoods. Well, we've had examples recently in the United Kingdom of um, very sensitive information about individuals, health records, military, police records, being lost because they've been left on a CD in the back of somebody's motor car. Uh, we've had examples of people being uh, able to hack into what should be very, very secure systems. For example, uh, as I speak, there is a, an extradition warrant out for an individual in the United Kingdom who hacked into the United States Navy, military, uh, NASA, and the Defense Department computers uh, nearly a hundred times. Now, this, this kind of thing is, is tremendously worrying because you can imagine that if a private investigator or the police or a criminal organization was trying to blackmail somebody or try to get personal information or just trying to get your or my credit card numbers, that it would be relatively easy for them to do it, given the porousness of uh, these uh, um, data storage instruments and the fact that it's very, very difficult to keep them secure and to police them properly. So by giving up so much of our personal information as we do every time we buy something online or every time we talk to somebody on a, on a mobile phone, we're exposing ourselves to risk. And one can think uh, that uh, in the records of for example, British banks, uh, people are claiming that their credit card numbers have been misused. There would be thousands and thousands of such cases every year. But what is possible today with social technologies is profound. Namely, you can be sitting at your house in your, in your pajamas and you can actually impact the lives of someone sitting in a country hundreds of thousands of miles away that is wrought with political strife. You can say, I'm here, I'm listening to you. One of our, one of our Ning networks is, uh, is the Congo Wall, which was created by Eve Ensler, who had just gotten back from the Congo with her V-Day organization, where women are being brutalized um, as, a, as a means of fighting a war. And the fact of the matter is they feel alone. And with social technology, Women from all over the world could come to this, this Ning network and leave a message for the women of the Congo. You're not alone. 
And those messages, over 2,000 women and, and men around the world actually contributed, one of the, uh, contributed a message. They printed them out and took them to the hospital in the Congo where, where women were recovering. No one is alone anymore. And I actually think that's a really powerful thing. You can sit at your house and make change. And, and we're talking about social change and political change and economic change in a way that was never possible before. And I think that that's something that we should embrace and that we should look at what are the ways that we're going to make it the best of what people can be as opposed to the worst of what people can be. Should we, is this generation, are they going to be all right? Are the kids going to be doing okay? Or should we be kids okay? are all right. The kids are all right. What kind of person bullies a vulnerable child online? Many Canadians learned of Amanda Todd's tortured life only after the 15-year-old ended it. She posted her story for the world to see in a YouTube video detailing an ordeal of online abuse, of being blackmailed, hunted, and driven to a sense of helplessness by someone who kept turning the people in her life against her. Amanda was like so many Canadian teenagers, spending hours online meeting new friends. But there are many dark corners on the internet, and they would find her. In this video, which she posted online just weeks before her suicide, she explained how some people in online chat rooms encouraged her to flash her breasts on her webcam, which she did. It was a decision that would haunt her till her death. I think one of the things that has happened to the first generation of kids to grow up always being online, which by the way are my kids, they have never experienced dial-up or anything like that. They've always had always on. And what I've seen is they have a, a global awareness that was not present in my generation. They really feel as if this is one world. They also feel as if they are always connected to everyone else. There is a feeling of being connected that I did not have in my generation. And I think the third thing is that there is a sense of movement forward, the sense of going somewhere of maybe you might call it progress that I think was not present in previous generations. After three years of hell that began with their 12 year old, a webcam and one bad decision. Here's ABC's Rena Nina. Well, I think the web is a reflection of society. It's, it's the web is pornography, gossip, flirting, um, power plays, people making money. I mean, the web isn't a sort of utopian collective. It's life reflected on the web. But the nature of the web, because it allows this ability to create a very distributed way and for people to connect and collaborate, it makes things possible in ways that they weren't before. It's now possible to collaborate more effectively than ever before without having a traditional organization. It's created a new menu of options for us to get things done together in new ways. That is significantly different. So in that sense, it's not simply reflecting how society is, it's opening up options for us to behave and be in different ways. And that's what's really significant about it. Students believe that a very good way to create real positive social good change is using computer science. We're sort of bringing in a different way for students to view technology to say you can build things that help disaster relief, you can build things that help low-income high school students find ways to go through college and find careers. Change the world through technology, we want to make that happen. Yeah, I, like, I like the thought of whether the internet in over 40 years tells us something about human beings. I'm a positive person and an optimistic person and I think that the web has reinforced what I believe about human nature is that it's good and it's when put together it can create great things you know I find the web a friendly place I don't like this extremist view that the web is suddenly a danger zone where unpleasant people can more easily find their vulnerable targets you know that's the extremities as it always has been in every society and as long as you educate to make people safe i think the bulk of what happens in the web is interesting exciting supportive fun entertaining and magic regardless of whether you think you know social technology and the internet is good or bad it, it is this is what you know the, 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 the genie is out of the bottle 
And I think that's an amazing thing. The social web can do more good in the world than it can do bad. And it's the choice of people and the people who are using it as to what they want to do with it. It is the most empowering generational shift that has ever happened. And I think that that is what makes it so compelling and so inspiring and so much fun.